Right, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about brown bears in uh, Roman, medieval and post-medieval, just to mix it up a bit, Britain. Um, so, the brown bear. It's Europe's largest terrestrial carnivore. Many of you here will be familiar with this glorious beast. Those of us from England and, well, Britain are not familiar with it because um, they've been extinct for some time. Quite exactly how long, we don't know at the moment, but they have been extinct for some time. So, given that they are the largest carnivore, would we consider them to be an urban animal? Now, those of you who live in countries where they're scavenging in your bins, you might begin to think, yes, they, you know, they are lurking in urban areas. But um, in the Roman period, in the medieval period, would we consider a bear to be urban? That's what I'm going to think about today. Okay, a brief overview of bears in Britain. So this is a paper that I published recently in Mammal Review, looking at bears in Britain over the Holocene. And you can see we've got a really wide distribution. Uh, I'm going to try not to fall off the uh, so From northern Scotland down to uh, Dartmoor in southern England, we have a massive distribution of um, bears in Britain all over the place, even on some of the islands. So off in the, in the Hebrides, we've got island bears probably being transported. So We've got a wide range, there's a number of sites. In total, we have 57 known dated sites from the Holocene. There's another 30 or more that have no dates. And so the picture that I'm presenting today may change when we finally get some radiocarbon dates. Looking at the sites that we have, those 57 of known date, I've got here split into anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic sites. Anthropogenic sites are burials, ditches, castles, villas, anywhere that's a human construction that has bears within it. Non-anthropogenic sites are caves and bogs, places where we've got no evidence that humans were interacting with that animal. And as you can see, in the Mesolithic we have a glorious... Oh, no, you can't see. All right, in the Mesolithic we have four sites with wild bears, and then they drop off. We've got almost no evidence of bears that are not from anthropogenic sites in Britain after the end of the Mesolithic. We have just those two, both of which have question marks over them for different reasons, and I'll happily discuss them with anyone who wants to talk about them after the session. Okay, so that's our distribution through time. What can we say about the bears themselves? Just as an introduction, if we look at the, what's in the boxes, it's what we find in each time period. So in the late glacial and Mesolithic, we've got all body parts. Well, so we've got long bones, we've got vertebrae, we've got body parts that suggest you've got whole bears. Not the things that you would collect and take home from a holiday as a glorious souvenir. Nobody wants a cervical vertebra as a holiday souvenir. You might want claws, you might want teeth. You're unlikely to want the back. So, Lake Glacier Mesolithic, it looks like we've got whole animals. Neolithic, we've only got parts of the head and part of the forelimb. So, is that something important about the forelimb of the bear and the Neolithic? Don't know, but that's all we've got at the moment. Bronze Age, we've got nothing. Well, that's not true. There's a skin. There is one skin, but no bones. Iron Age, just feet. Early medieval period, heads and feet. They're both from cremations. So, people are being wrapped in a bear skin, set fire to. Their cremated bones are collected, that's where we get the claws from. But in the Roman period, the medieval period, and post medieval period, we've got all bears, all parts of bears again. So my suggestion is, and this is a working hypothesis at the moment, and I will happily be wrong, we have definitely bears in the Mesolithic, and then we've got complete bears in the Roman period and medieval and post medieval, and I think that from the Roman period onward they're actually being imported to Britain. It's not that these are native animals. And again, I'm happy to discuss with people why I think that. And I'm happy to be wrong if you've got suggestions. Okay, so moving on to distributions then. Looking at those Roman bears, we've got two types of site. This is it. There are no rural bears in Roman Britain. There are no sites, rural sites, that have bears. We've got them in um, Colchester and London. So where we've got three there, there's three sites in Colchester, three sites in London. So Colchester, the centre of Roman Britain, which then moves to London. So not surprisingly, perhaps, that we've got most bears there. And then we've got three villa sites down 
in the south which also have bears. If we look at what's present, we've got a tooth at one villa, a phalange at the other, and we've got some long bones, burnt long bones. So look, the tooth and the phalange suggest to me either, you know, uh, a bearskin rug with a head still on it, with claws, or um, somebody collecting teeth because they look interesting. Um, the long bones, there must be a bear, I would have thought, in that area. But we've got all body parts in the other places, and just teeth and phalanges at those two. Now, if you've read any of the London literature, there is a suggestion that we had bears from the London Roman Amphitheatre. This gorgeous specimen is from Draper's Garden. It's the best one we've got from Roman Britain. It's pretty much the best bear we've got from Britain. Um, and it comes from a pit which has lots of Roman pottery in it near the amphitheatre. It probably postdates the amphitheatre, but was it kept as a souvenir? It may be about, you know, did, did somebody go, oh, you know, I'll keep that head. It reminds me of the glorious days we saw when things were being eaten in the amphitheatre. We don't know. In the literature, there is also a humorous. You will read about it. If you read anything about uh, British Roman amphitheatres, there is um, information about a humerus from the London Amphitheatre. It's lost. And when they were doing the final bone report, they couldn't find it. So we cannot confirm there is a bear at all from, from the London Amphitheatre. Currently, there is no evidence for bears in the British amphitheatres eating people or doing any of the other things that the Romans enjoyed doing with bears. Moving on to the medieval period, we've got castles, towns and cities, and an abbey. Um, we've got again two sites with two bones, uh, York and London, and everybody else has just got one or two. All of those circled in green are just phalanges. So my suggestion is if we've only got claws, we're looking at skins being imported. And so we've got skins for York, for Chester, for Wigmore Castle, and for Incheon Abbey. Um, and the rest are all body parts being represented in these other areas. So perhaps people are, you know, furnishing your abbot's uh, room with a nice bearskin rug, or the castle's got a nice bearskin on the wall to make people think you're important. Post-medieval, we've got a very different distribution. There is one in Edinburgh, and there are ten sites in London. Oh, hang on. The Edinburgh site is a former uh, anatomy school in the hospital. Um, and it looks like bear remains were kept there in order to compare them to human remains. So um, that's what they are. Those ones from London, why are there so many in London? Because they are all down in the playhouses. So there's nine sites just in this region, just more in that, that blob, uh, where we have uh, bear remains. There's also one other, it's Victorian, so 19th century, which is a furrier's workshop. So it's a taxidermist, they've got leopard, they've got uh, tortoise, they've got bear, and they're obviously being imported, people bringing home trophies to be prepared. But other than that, the only other sites are these playhouses. Why are they there? Well, bears, as we know, were used extensively for entertainment, well, we might say entertainment now, um, with, uh, here we've got an ape persuading a bear to do somersaults, and in 1174, we have this quote, saying that huge bears do battle with hounds let loose upon them. And that is the sport of bear baiting, where you tie a bear to a stake and you let dogs loose on it, and you bet on whether the bear will be killed, how many bears the dog will kill, no, sorry, how many dogs the bear will kill, whether they help far they'll throw them in the air, and other such delights. And there's a rather lo lovely pot from our home city of, yeah, home city of Nottingham, um, where you can see they're holding what looks like well, what was told to me is a cub originally, but in fact it's holding a dog. So it's the bear hug here, crushing the dog during a bear baiting. And there's a hole, you can see there's a hole in the muzzle, that's where a chain goes through. So bears were being used as entertainment. Who goes to these entertainments? Everybody. Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, James I, they love it. The Spanish ambassador comes to, um, comes to Britain, they put on a special baiting for him, it's, it's the thing to do. So everybody from monarchs to tradesmen and women were going to the baitings. So it's, this blood sport is not purely for men. This blood sport is also uh, attended by women. And it was banned 
1835, but bear dancing continued um, until probably just after the First World War, but we don't really know. Um, no, it's not been researched, it would be lovely if it were. This is an illustration from an improving Victorian novel for children about um, a bear who is, uh, as you can see, a dancing bear, but, you know, is happy with his lot and becomes a rug when he dies. Um, so an overview then, we've got Roman bears, they're found in villas and towns. Live bears in towns, mainly skins, but not entirely at villas. In the medieval and post-medieval world, We've got bears in castles, abbeys, and towns, live bears and skins in towns, mainly skins. So two skins, a uh, castle and the abbey. There's one castle that doesn't have a skin, so it's not entire. But there seems to be some differentiation between where you're getting live bears and where you're getting dead bears. So the conclusions are that bears are only found at elite sites or in towns in both Roman and medieval Britain, and there are no, appears to be no linkage between the military and the bears in the Roman period. There's no, there are no bears on military sites. They seem to have been important both alive and dead. They're alive for entertainment of the masses, although actually who got the money for that um, were the, um, the elites. And they're dead, possibly being used for demonstration of wealth and status because we're finding these, the evidence for rugs in castles, abbeys, villas, posh places. And they were probably the most familiar wild animal in Roman, medieval, and post-medieval urban landscapes. You've got people used to horses, there's cattle, there's sheep, they'll know all of those. Um, a dog's cat. But in terms of the wild, the exotic, in Britain at least, where the bear is extinct in the wild, bears are being found as entertainment in streets, in tiny villages, in big towns, um, certainly in the medieval and throughout the post-medieval into the 20th century. So they are an urban animal. There you go, that's me finished. <laughs>